Welcome back to Face the Nation. We turn now to a Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, Alabama Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Congresswoman, welcome. Thanks so much, Margaret. Now, the accusation is that Democrats were chomping at the bit to impeach, but you say you were actually very reluctant to move ahead with this. Well, you know, look, it's not because I didn't think that there were um, really unpresidential behavior by this president from moment one, uh, but because I was worried uh, that it would get us sidetracked from other more important uh, items for the American people. But I do believe that we've crossed a, a Rubicon here. Um, I do believe that uh, this whistleblower um, allegation is so serious, it gets to the very heart of our nation's democracy, uh, the integrity of our elections. Uh, and if any district understands that, it's my district, Alabama's 7th Congressional District, which uh, was the Civil Rights District, where mm -hmm. people died, fought, uh, bled for the right to vote. And the integrity of our elections are a question. When the President of the United States asks a foreign leader for a favor and then withholds millions of dollars of foreign aid in order to solicit interference in, in our mm -hmm. election, I don't think it gets more important than that. As you've heard, Republicans dispute this idea that there was a quid pro quo and dismiss this whistleblower a, as just relaying hearsay. You don't need a quid pro quo. Um, the reality is that the complaint speaks for itself and it corroborates the partial mm -hmm. readout that we received earlier in the week. So I think that, you know, none of us come to Congress to try to impeach the president. I know the people I uh, elected me to go to Congress to lower prescription drug prices for them, to make sure that we have uh, an equal level pl playing field when it comes to education. But I think that we find ourselves at a very sombering moment in Americans' history. And we can either uh, choose to live by the oath that we took, which is to uphold this Constitution and get to the bottom of what's going on. We need to understand that what, we've, uh, what the speaker has done is initiated an inquiry, mm -hmm. an inquiry. And Obviously, the roadmap is the complaint. It, uh, it raises lots of concerns as to the extent of uh, this, sp this president's uh, portrayal, uh, and we need to get to the bottom of that. We need to do so in a deliberate manner. Deliberate manner. How quickly is this actually going to move from inquiry to articles of impeachment? Well, I can tell you that we in the uh, Intel Committee are working diligently through this uh, Rosh Hashanah break, um, and uh, we don't know exactly when it will come, but we do know that we're working in a deliberate, thoughtful manner. Uh, we'll follow the uh, facts where they lead us. And the American people deserve to understand and know to what extent did the president, um, you know, uh, interfere in our mm -hmm. elections and to what extent has it been a cover up? I think all of those things are, unfortunately, we're, we're at this moment in American history, but we need to live up to our oath if the president's not going to live up to his. As a Democrat, you said this worried you, that you wouldn't be able to get real work done for your constituents. In the polling that CBS has done, 42% of people polled think Congress will still work on legislation. 58% of Americans say they're going to be just too distracted. But we've already shown that we can do both. How can you work with the president when there's an effort underway to impeach him? How is it po possible to do both things? Well, first of all, we can do things uh, in a methodical, uh, diligent way. The Intel Committee will, will conduct the investigation, and I'm on the House Ways and Means Committee. We are working diligently to address a surprise billing, to address uh, the prescription drug uh, problem that we have in America. I'm also on the working group uh, of Democrats that's looking at USMCA. Right. So we have a lot of things going on simultaneously. Um, we are multitaskers as legislators, and we can do both. Congresswoman, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'll be tracking how the committee investigation continues. We will be right back with the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. He is standing by for us in New York, so don't go away. We're back now with President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who is called a central figure in the whistleblower complaint. He joins us from New York this morning. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Margaret. Why wouldn't the president reach out first to law enforcement, to his own agencies, if his concern was truly about corruption? Why bring this up in a phone call with the leader of Ukraine? Well, this, I mean, this goes back actually to November of 2018. I, I wasn't asking for this. Uh, someone came to me, a very well-respected in investigator, American citizen, and told me that in, in, in Ukraine, there were a number of allegations of interference in the 2016 election that appear to be um, real and truthful, unlike the 
Russian uh, collusion hoax. And that it was really ironic that Hillary Clinton, the Democratic National Committee, our embassy there, was collecting dirt going back to the early part of 2016 on the Trump campaign, on uh, people who operated in the Trump campaign, on the president, and that there were witnesses, quite a few of them, that would support this. And they've been trying to get it to the FBI for a year to a year and a half, and they have been frustrated in, in doing so. So having gotten that, as his defense lawyer, I had to pursue it. They would Sorry, not talk Chris to the Ray, FBI. The because FBI they, director appointed by President Trump, you're saying, refused to look at this? I didn't say he refused to look at it. I you said, said they the FBI were afraid. wouldn't look at it. I said they were afraid to go to the FBI because they had been turned down so often. And one of the central figures in it is a uh, FBI agent who appears to be involved in the gathering of dirt work with a particular company owned by George Soros that was collecting this information. That company is one of the companies where Biden's uh, bribery of Poroshenko, he got that case dismissed. People were ignoring that, that Biden played a role in getting these collusion allegations uh, covered up by having the case against Antac uh, dismissed. So it was all one piece. The reason I investigated it yep. is as his defense lawyer, it's my job to show if there's an alternative explanation that proves him innocent. Well, I got it to the point, well, let me finish, I got it to the point of affidavits. I put them all online. Mm -hmm. Here's one of them. Well, that, sorry, can um, we finish on, here, on the first point here, you brought here, up? Because here, it's here, very here's complicated, one of them. Mr. Mayor. I want well, to I know, I know nobody to what you just laid to, out. I know, no, I want to actually, I, know I, I want to bring wants up to, to cover you. No, we the, did. Actually, CBS News uh, and our partners, BBC, in Ukraine went to the prosecutor general to ask him specifically about uh, about the Biden questions you were raising, the current one. Let's play the clip, please. And I uh, told uh, Mr. Giuliani, OK, if you start your investigation in the United States, we can officially help you. According to international law, we will give you legal international uh, assistance. Have you got any evidence that Joe Biden acted in any way which supported Hunter Biden's company Burisma? It is not my jurisdiction. But have you got any? It is not my jurisdiction. I uh, can't do nothing which but is not connected yeah. with Ukrainian law. Uh, so under Ukrainian law, you've got nothing? Nothing. So that was Sergei Lysenko, who is one of the advisors to the current president. We also no, spoke no, no, off no, no, camera no. to Margaret, the prosecutor Margaret, general who said this is there very was no embarrassing. evidence there. Margaret, this is exceedingly embarrassing. Mr. Lutsenko has been fired by the current president. Mr. Lutsenko is exactly the prosecutor that Joe Biden put in in order to uh, tank the case. And it is suspected. You met with him he repeatedly, he says. About this. Well, he's not the current prosecutor general. Right, I know. I said the prosecutor general. We, we, prosecutor no, no, general, no. we spoke with off camera as well, you, and he had failed, to the Washington but, Post and other organizations said yeah, I know, uh, well, that yeah, he didn't have. Well, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe of you all are so blinded because this is a Democrat. You're not doing your job properly. The prosecutor general you should have spoken to is the one who was fired, who has said in this affidavit that he was fired specifically because he was investigating Joe Biden's son. This has been online for six months, mm -hmm. and the Washington media just closes their eyes to it. That's the wrong prosecutor general you're talking to. The, the prosecutor even, general even you're simple, referring to there even, is Victor even, Shokin, he, and that is online. You shared that with our team, and we did look at it, and he was called to be fired, not just also, by the United States, but other organizations who but, said but he, he wasn't he, investigating. In fact, he was fired but, but for the he, thing he, he, you're saying he, he wasn't doing. But Margaret, he says the opposite under oath. He In an Austrian court, you're oath. showing there, yes. Did and that's a court also, filing on also, behalf of uh, another invite, individual who's I, facing extradition I to the United your, States. I, I, I invite your reporters, who I'm sure are interested in digging out corruption, to see if this isn't corroborated by three other prosecutors who say the same thing. The one that you interviewed is the one who was corrupted. And Mr. there are a lot Mr. of allegations Mr. Mayor, about I, I want to ask you about something that has developed in the past few cases, hours. Including against Soros. I, I want to ask you, because you may have direct knowledge here, um, since you have said Kurt Volker, the U.S. envoy to Ukraine, set up those meetings you said for you with Ukraine's leaders. Um, he has resigned. Do you know why? 
I don't know why Kurt resigned. I mean, there uh, he's wasn't being shared with this me. Week. Kurt, Kurt um, did his job honorably and decently. I think there are a lot of people in the State Department who maybe have questions about what he did and why he did it. But I should tell you, he wasn't the only one. He was joined by another ambassador who talk, talked to me, uh, debriefed me, uh, gave me information about what to ask uh, Mr. Mr. Yermak. Who is I that? did not do this on my own. I did it at the request of the State Department. And I have all of the text messages to prove it. And I also have a thank you from them from doing a good job. Who, so, uh, who sent you that? I don't know did, why did, the State did, Department did is running away Did Secretary of State Pompeo it. know you were doing these things? Did he ask you to do these things? He did not. Uh, Mr. Mr. Um, Volker did, and then Mr. Sondland did. But when I talked to the secretary last week, he said he was aware of it. He told me that he was aware of it. So he, you're saying the Secretary of State didn't instruct you to set up these meetings, but he knew what you were doing when you were well, meeting wait, 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 with wait, members wait. of the Ukrainian I, government. No, I'm asking you to I, clarify I, that. What, what exactly did Pompeo I'll, know? I think I clarified it, but I'm happy to say it again. Please do. On, Je on uh, July 19th, uh, 2019, Kurt Volker called me, text message to prove it. I put it out last week. Would you please, uh, would you allow me to give your phone number to Mr. Yermak, who wants to talk to you to right. clear up the confusion about your canceled trip to the Ukraine? I said, it's up to you. You think I should do it? He said, the guy's a straight guy, unlike another lawyer who, right. around the president who's crooked. I said, I'm willing to do it. Let me check the guy out first. I called him back two or three days later. We arranged a meeting. Mm -hmm. He knew about the meeting. At the end of the meeting, I called Mr. Volker and Ambassador Sondland, and I debriefed them. I told them okay. what I had learned. And then on August 11, I had a complete debriefing. All right. Uh, at, at the time, they didn't mention the Secretary of State. They don't have to. They're both as right. ambassadors and assistant secretaries, I think. Yeah. However, we, when I spoke, when I spoke to, to the Secretary last week, yes. I said, I, I, are you aware of this? And he said, yes, I know about okay. this. Thank you well, for clarifying that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we will be back in a moment with our panel. It's now time for some analysis from our panel. Adam Entus is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Paula Reed is a White House correspondent here at CBS. Michael Morell is a CBS News senior national security contributor and a former acting director of the CIA. He also served as an advisor to Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016. And Rachel Bade covers Congress for the Washington Post. Uh, Paula, a lot to unpack. Um, let's start with the president's attorney where we just left off there. Uh, what stood out to you? He didn't answer the core question, which is if you thought there was any evidence of wrongdoing, why did you go to Ukraine? Why didn't you go to U.S. law enforcement? The attorney general has been clear. The president has never asked him to look into anything related to the Bidens in Ukraine. Uh, Rudy Giuliani has presented this affidavit. There are other officials who give a differing account. But at the, at the core of this is if you think there's a problem, why wouldn't you go to the FBI? Why wouldn't you go to the Justice Department? Or are you just trying to sow questions and seeds of doubt in the absence of any true evidence? And in that partial call transcript, the attorney general is mentioned a few times by the president. But what you're reporting is that there was no actual contact that happened. Exactly. And I've learned from a person familiar that he was angry. He was surprised that he would be lumped in with Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani is the president's personal attorney. William Barr is the nation's top law enforcement official. And it raises the question about whether the president thinks those two are one and the same. Now, there is some some reason for him to think that uh, William Barr has been his staunchest uh, defender. The way he handled the Mueller report, very favorable to the president. But now it's up to William Barr going forward to try to allay any of those concerns. Mike, you know Russia, you know Ukraine, you know what happened at the time. When you hear this sort of retelling of history and what happened during the Biden-Obama years, yes. uh, what are you hearing? What stands out to you? What do we need to know? What stands out to me is that there is a complete absence of clarity here, right? So there's this image that the vice president acted on his own. No, he was the point man for administration policy, interagency agreement, agreement across countries that we needed to pressure Ukraine to get tough on corruption. He wasn't freelancing. He was not freelancing. The second is that there's a deep irony here, right, is that the investigation of Brisman was on hold. And one of the things we were concerned about was that there wasn't enough investigations going on about corruption. Burisma was on hold when Biden was pressuring. This is so the gas the, company the, that Hunter Biden ended up on the board. Exactly. So the irony here is that 
the vice president in pressing the prosecutor general to resign to be fired, right, was actually creating an opportunity for Burisma investigation to reopen, right? So it's the direct opposite of what everybody thinks. It's confusing to the public, though, as well here. Um, and I know you, Adam, have been digging into uh, Hunter Biden and the work he did do for right. this gas right. company. Uh, is there any there there? Well, I think there's two issues. Uh, one, should Hunter have taken this position when his father was, uh, you know, vice president, playing a key role in shaping policy towards Ukraine? Should some of Biden's advisors or White House officials or State Department officials have said to Joe Biden or said to Hunter Biden, you know what, you really shouldn't be on this board? That never happened. So that's a, I think that's a legitimate question. Uh, on the issue of whether Joe Biden used his office in order to have Shokin, this prosecutor, fired. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at this. Uh, mo much of what I see is the opposite. Um, the oligarch who, who, who recruited a Hunter to be on this board, when Shokin was the prosecutor, he was in Ukraine. He, was, he felt safe, according to former board members. He didn't feel like he had any, je he was in legal, legal jeopardy at all. It was once Shokin was fired and Lutsenko, who was the person who you interviewed here, took over as the prosecutor, that's when the oligarch, Lachevsky, decided to leave the country. He went to Dubai at that point because that's when he was concerned that he might actually be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. So really when, when Shokin leaves, that's when the oligarch feels like he's actually in jeopardy. Rachel, you heard uh, Senator Graham on this program fully defend the president here. This is someone who knows the details of this region, these policies. Uh, are other Republicans standing by the president on this fight? Yeah, I mean, largely the party is sticking with the president right now. We are seeing a little cracks begin to emerge. I will say privately, we hear a lot of griping from lawmakers on the Hill who are wondering why the president put out this transcript to begin, Lewis, and, and think that there is something that really is damaging. Um, we have seen a couple of Republicans start to crack. Mitt Romney, for example, came out and said that this was uh, disturbing, uh, sort of un unacceptable. We saw um, Republicans in a hearing last week uh, Mike Turner from Dayton, Ohio, say that this sort of action, asking a foreign leader to investigate a political adversary with, that would benefit you, is point blank not okay. But there's a difference between some Republicans, and I can probably count them on one or two hands, who are willing to say that this sort of activity is not acceptable and actually saying that this is an impeachable offense. We saw um, a really interesting sort of flip-flop over the weekend with a Republican um, from Nevada, Mark Amaday. He had been talking to reporters on Friday saying, Let's see where this goes. He was asked about the impeachment inquiry, and it seemed like he was supporting it, saying, you know, this is an investigation. There are concerning allegations here. Let's see where it goes. Well, within 24 hours, he totally <laughs> walked back on that and said, I was never supporting the impeachment investigation. And again, this is just showing that the, this is a party that sticks with the president, who is very popular with their base. Mike, the whistleblower, um, as we've been reporting, came from the intelligence community. Um, and yet you have Republicans saying everything laid, laid out in that complaint was just hearsay. From the work you saw at, that was then made public, does that look like it's based on just hearsay? So the whistleblower seems to me to be highly credible. Whistleblower made a number of allegations. We know that the first allegation that the phone call was made and the ask was made about investigating the vice president was 100 percent correct. The whistleblower lays out not just the fact that they received this from one source, but multiple sources. The whistleblower complaint is detailed. Um, it's compelling. Um, we still need to look into the other allegations, but I think the whistleblower is highly credible. In other words, this looks like uh, an analysis product that an agency so, would produce. So when I read it, I said this is a high quality piece of CIA analysis. Um, this person was well trained. They're highly skilled. Um, I was kind of proud of the product, right, and looking at it. Um, it seemed to me like this was a piece of CIA analysis. Paula, are White House officials actually nervous or are they embracing impeachment as the fight they want to have? Look, the president is not 
likely to be removed from office. That's just basic math. And so far, this administration has constantly been under this cloud of controversy and scandal. But the real concern is that now this impeachment inquiry and possible articles of impeachment makes it almost impossible mm -hmm. to, to expect any kind of success on the legislative front. Uh, they were making some progress getting the president's proposal together uh, for gun control legislation. Uh, they were hoping for maybe something on prescription drugs, the USMCA. Now their biggest concern is they may not have much to show uh, when they go on the campaign trail in 2020, particularly a trade deal. The president so far has not been able to get any of his trade deals actually approved. The USMCA was his big hope. Right. And with this, unlikely. Adam, why aren't we seeing Joe Biden out there sitting down, actively defending his son and giving detailed explanations for all of this? There's a lot of dirt being kicked up into the air. I mean, there's a reason why uh, they're focusing on Hunter. Um, this, is a, this is a really delicate issue for Joe Biden, um, particularly delicate in the period that we're talking about, because this is right when Bo is very sick and getting, you know, is his last year of life, which is really when Hunter takes this, makes this deal to work with Burisma, this Ukrainian company. And historically, you know, um, aides to Biden just never wanted to address this issue with him. It was too sensitive. Things that involved his family were just considered to be off limits, largely to his staff, and I think to a to a fault, you know, he, you know, was reluctant to really say anything to his son, you know, about the appropriateness of some of his business choices. And the way they dealt with it was like a don't ask, don't tell policy, where Hunter uh, wouldn't tell his father about his activities, and uh, Joe Biden wouldn't ask, and so they just had this area that they didn't discuss. And that kind of allowed this thing to sort of stew. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if this had been addressed early on uh, in 2014, when this became public that he was on this board, um, you know, we wouldn't be maybe discussing it now. Rachel, is opening the inquiry ultimately something that could backfire for Democrats because it keeps this story out there? That was the number one concern uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi had about impeachment when she opened the new Congress this year. I mean, she has been the single greatest reason why Democrats, who overwhelmingly have favored for impeachment for a while, um, have not charged forward. But this, um, Pelosi has said to her colleagues, she said it publicly, this is something different. This is. Um, there were concerns that, for example, Robert Mueller's report about 10 instances of potential obstruction of justice, that that wasn't resonating with the public. There were uh, suggestions that even though federal prosecutors named Trump as the number one individual involved in allegations of, uh, well, actually paying off women who alleged fares mm -hmm. uh, with the president in 2016, that wasn't resonating with the public, and the public wasn't supporting impeachment. But we are seeing in some of these CBS numbers just today yeah. that that's changing. 55% supporting an impeachment inquiry, more people supporting the impeachment of the president than actually do not. Pelosi, it seems, was right that this was something different and that this mm -hmm. is going to move public sentiment potentially continuing in their direction. Major story. We'll continue following. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching and thank you to the Jones Day Law Firm for hosting us. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.